Good evening, and welcome to Woman. In 1970, according to the Department of Commerce, American women spent $14 billion on cosmetics and other beauty aids. My guest, Deborah Chase, is here to discuss some of the facts about cosmetics. In 1963, Deborah was chosen as one of seven top young scientists in the country by the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. She has done research in aging at New York University Medical Center and on viruses under grants from the National Institute of Health. She was trained in biology at New York University, and Deborah is the author of the medically based No Nonsense Beauty book. Deborah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Deborah, do you know about how many American women use cosmetics? Do you have any of those figures? Well, just about all women use cosmetics. In fact, all men and all children use cosmetics. And by the definition of cosmetics, which is that which is poured, sprinkled, spread, or somehow put on the surface of the skin. And um, the FDA regulations theoretically cover all these substances. Who controls the cosmetic industry? Uh, the cosmetic industry controls the cosmetic industry. Um, the FDA and to a lesser extent the FTC have regulations which are supposed to uh, control the industry, but they're very weak. Uh, the, the federal agencies themselves are very understaffed for the cosmetic division of the FDA, which you gave the figure 14 billion, and Senator Eagleton says it's 60 billion dollar a year industry. Um, there are 13 full-time investigators, which is a fruitless task trying to, you know, manage such a huge industry. And the statutes themselves that control the industry really don't get to the root of the problem. And even if um, they finally do find something wrong with the industry, and they say you have to stop it, that's all they do say you have to stop it. And the fact that somebody has paid a great deal of money, and a lot of people have paid a great deal of money for a product, uh, they don't get their money back. Well, what about the new labeling laws? I mean, aren't they supposed to help cover up a lot of the past evils? Well, the new labeling laws, um, theoretically, should just give you the ingredients that are in the package, and that's a very good aid as far as consumer comparison and as far as allergies. But the labeling laws are now in a tremendous state of uh, problems because they're legally, there's just enormous hassle. Um, so they aren't in effect? Oh, no. They were supposed to be in effect in March of 75, and we all waited. And around six months ago, a lot of consumer people realized there was a problem because none of the new products were coming out with the ingredients listed on the label. So that, um, and the cosmetic um, sales personnel did not know anything about the, you know, what labeling, no. And um, finally, in March of 75, uh, the FDA sort of ignored the fact that 18 months ago they had issued to say this is the final order and they issued another final order. Um, and when I spoke to them, they said, well, there were problems with color and uh, fragrance, that there were a lot of ingredients in color and fragrance and they were having trouble listing them. And um, it's, it's sort of being hung up on that issue. The issue is, of course, that the cosmetic companies did not want to have their ingredients listed on the label. But all that, that won't take care of a great many other problems, which is cosmetics hit the market without any pre-marketing testing required, uh, that there is no list of ingredients that are considered harmful that automatically must be excluded from cosmetics. What is it? What do you think would be a good definition of cosmetic injury? Uh, it's something that, that bothers you enough to say, what, what did I use? What, did, what happened? Um, and this can be anything from a, a little redness at the corner of your mouth, from a lipstick that contained a dye that irritated you, to very severe um, allergic reactions that cause permanent hair loss. Um, and uh, there are certain products which are more prone to giving allergies than others. W what are those products? You know? Well, I think... Uh, without any brand names. Okay, with depilatories uh, sort of head the list of problems. I think most of us have ever tried them. The first time we get away with it, the second time there are these little red spots. Um, and they cause a lot of problems, mainly because just the whole principle is, is, is just going to cause problems. Uh, then hair dyes cause a considerable percentage of allergic reactions. Uh, antiperspirants cause another enormous uh, group of complaints. And, uh, you know, there's, there's very poor reporting of complaints at this point that uh, the FDA and the cosmetic companies claim a very low incidence of allergy. But I don't think most people have ever reported uh, their complaints. I mean, how many people now sitting at home had a, what they feel is a cosmetic allergy and just have forgotten, have not even gone to a doctor because what's the use? And many times it is pretty fruitless that there is no direct action taken. What about the vaginal sprays? For a long time there were some things being said about the vaginal sprays. Right, well that's a product 
created that, that really should never have hit the market. I mean, I can see the reason for a face cream or an acne lotion, but vaginal, you know, the whole concept is horrible. And uh, there were a lot of problems. They didn't know if the problem was from the aerosol, just the concept of aerosol in that area, or that the substance itself was irritating. It changed the flora. Um, and they're still in the market. There's strong evidence they should be removed. And um, sometimes uh, I think the formulas have been changed in some of the worst offenders of the vaginal sprays. What recourse does a person have who, who thinks they have a cosmetic injury? Well, right now there are two forms that the FDA uh, gives to doctors to fill out uh, that just sort of put, so they can put into a computer form the kind of complaints that are coming in. I think people should just automatically either contact the doctor, which is going to entail an, you know, a doctor's visit and the expense, or call at the FDA and ask them for the form. Make a point of making your complaint so that they can gather enough complaints. Complaints are going on computer, and once there's an enormous amount of evidence indicating that there's a lot more complaints than anybody ever thought, I think that a lot more action could be taken. Is there a system in existence where doctors can complain? Well, doctors can complain, uh, and they're now theoretically putting into effect a way that they can organize all these complaints coming in. Uh, unless you live in one of the areas where there is a local FDA office, you're not going to get a visit by an inspector. Um, so they're just going to take your complaint over the phone. And from people that I think they're pretty, uh, if not cynical, they're pretty cautious and say, well, you know, maybe you used it wrong, or maybe you're just an allergic person, or maybe you're nervous and you already had this thing before you used it. Um, I don't think they really uh, view cosmetics as the kind of problem that can cause allergies. And they do. There's, there's just no doubt about it. Well, there's some cosmetics that are labeled uh, hypoallergenic. Are, are, does that mean that necessarily that those are safe? Well, the point is, the concept hypoallergenic is a very good concept because there are certain ingredients that definitely cause allergies in a significant number of the population to determine legally. And uh, some um, hypoallergenic companies do remove these particular ingredients, even though they can be very good ingredients. And in my book, I talk about them as very active ingredients. But unfortunately, because they're so active and because they're so effective, they can cause allergies. But And these certain companies do release the information that they've taken out these ingredients and they've substituted others. But there are a lot of other companies that call their products hypoallergenic. They do not divulge their ingredients, either the ones they do use or the ones they don't use. Um, they say things like, 100% fragrance free or doctor tested or doctor approved or allergy tested, which could mean either a doctor looks at the bottle and says, well, I don't think it could hurt you, to a whole battery of tests where they say, yes, is this it will not cause this allergy or this reaction. Uh, one, I think the most important um, test is what they call the Dray's test, where uh, they test the reaction of a product in the eye. Can it cause scarring, corneal scarring, temporary loss of vision, conjunctivitis? And it's a very easy test to do, and it's a very inexpensive one. I think that it's a very important one to, to do for cosmetic testing. Is there a way to tell? I mean, what protection do we have? Um, you, we don't have very much protection. We sort of have to go by the good faith that cosmetic companies don't want lawsuits. So the cosmetic ingredients that we use today, they, they're not going to maim us. In the past, in the 30s, there used to be lead poison and arsenic that really were horrible. Uh, today, they're, they're not harmful. Um, many times they're useless or, and overpriced. Um, and the, the main thing today, if you, if you have propensity to allergies, if you've ever experienced one, be cautious about using any new product. Be cautious of using things with the smell of peppermint, um, because peppermint can be very irritating to the skin. Anything that stimulates the circulation or causes a reddening. Um, what general category of, of cosmetic products would have peppermint smelling things? Astringents certain masks, um, some washing uh, substances, uh, things that they put on after sunburn, cooling effect. Well, it's not really cooling. What is it? It's causing almost a burning, but the, the nerves for pain, for heat, and for cold run very close to each other. It's very hard to tell what, what's going on at that, what time. So um, it, the, there's also the patch test that you can do for yourself. Uh, this is very important uh, when you use hair dyes to give yourself a patch test. And the uh, companies which put out hair dyes suggest it on every single package to give yourself a test on to see if this product can cause an allergy. And um, the patch test is just take the sample of the, the hair dye exactly as you're going to use it. Some of them you have to mix together. So you just take out a little and you mix it. 
and you put it on a clean piece of cotton, and you put it just on the inside of your arm and behind your ear. And then you just let it dry and forget about it for 24 hours. Then look at it. If there's any redness, any itching, any, any change in the tissue whatsoever, don't use that particular hair dye. Or you can use another one. It's, what this means is you're allergic to this particular molecular configuration of this color, of this shade. Uh, you can use probably five shades darker or five shades lighter. Um, but this particular one is something to stay away from. There's a controversy right now about hair dyes. What do, what do you know about that? Yes, uh, this, a doctor in um, California, Dr. Ames, came out with a paper. He showed that um, hair dyes are mutagenic, meaning they change the, um, the genetic makeup of bacteria. And they're using bacteria as a very neat model system. It was a very beautifully done experiment. Um, and from the mutagenic, he said that frequently mutagenic substances are carcinogenic substances, meaning they cause cancer either in laboratory conditions or in, um, in laboratory animals. Uh, now, I, I ought to say that there is no evidence at this point to indicate that women who use hair dyes have a higher incidence of cancer than women who don't use hair dyes. Uh, but it's, it's something to look into, and the FDA is looking into it and seeing what the potential danger could be. Deborah, in the book you say that the wrong people are often asked mm -hmm. for cosmetic advice. What did you mean by that? Well, um, doctors often ignore cosmetic complaints, what we consider cosmetic complaints, and they say, well, just use plenty of soap and water and don't matter if your hair falls out, just smile and, you know, you're cute as it is. And it's very irritating to hear this, and so people go to cosmetic counters and they read cosmetic ads. And the people on counters are very sympathetic, and they really care, they spend a great deal of time, and, you know, you feel they really want to help you, and they have absolutely no medical background at all, and they get paid by commission for these products. Um, they're, they're taught to, to sell you product after product after product. They're taught to give you the middle size, because if they give you the cheap size, well, you, gee, you know, I'll take it, $3, I'll try it. Uh, if they give you the big size, you might be scared off by the $30 price tag. But the middle size, you know, it's not that unreasonable, and they can go up and they can go down, depending how you to react to it. You should always buy at the least expensive, the, the least, um, uh, the smallest size, because you can test a product to see if you like it or not. In the book, you also say that some of the least expensive products are equally effective. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes more. There's very, there's very little difference between cosmetics um, as far as price goes, because uh, there's just so many ingredients that you can use. And the raw ingredients are pennies, and the jar is always more expensive uh, than what you have inside it. Uh, for the less expensive, the very more expensive. It doesn't matter if you have turtle oil or apricot kernel oil or lanolin. Uh, the oil in dry skin just forms a protective coating on the skin to keep the water in. And the rarer the oil, that uh, doesn't mean it's going to do any better a job for you. In fact, uh, the animal fats, of which lanolin is the most common and the cheapest, is just about the best oil you can use. Where does the dollar, do you have a breakdown on the, where the cosmetic dollar goes? Okay, well, let's say take a, a dollar. Forty percent of that, or forty cents, goes to the retailer, which is a large markup, and you don't have that kind of markup on a lot of other consumer goods. I mean, a, a car would be a Volkswagen. If you mark it up all the way, the way cosmetics are marked up from raw ingredients, the final product would be about. $35,000. I mean, there's an enormous amount of, of, of excess money put in there. So, and then a great deal of it, about, oh, I'd say 40 cents again, is on advertising, promotion, publicity. Um, they estimate that 10% is on research, raw ingredients, uh, production control, everything that you're really paying for when you put it on your face. Then when you buy European products or foreign products, you're paying duty. For example, the most expensive a face cream around now is some nifty little item that's two and a half ounces for $85. Well, um, in its country of origin, France, it's two and a half ounces for $35. So you're paying a cool $50 for duty, which is not going to do anything for your appearance whatsoever. How about the research dollar? Do you have a breakdown on that? It's, I think it's something like one-tenth of one percent on pure research um, of most of the cosmetic companies. Some of them do a little more uh, because they're so either they're associated with a pharmaceutical company um, or they, they pride themselves on that image. But the majority of it is absolutely, you know, almost infinitesimal as far as pure 
research into what causes aging or what causes uh, your skin to wrinkle. Well, if they're not doing that kind of research, then what kind of research are they doing? Well, they do a lot of market research, like what do women want to be next year? Do they want to be a sun-dappled country girl or do they want to be a, a cool sophisticate? Um, that's, that takes a lot of money to figure that out. And then um, another research they do is how can they keep this stuff to last a long time on the shelf? Or how do they keep it um, so that it doesn't, you know, turn brown and glocky in the window of a hot drugstore. That, that's also a very big part of the research dollar. Um, and then another one is, you know, now you have it in a cream or a spray. How about an aerosol? It's, it's just changing the form and the packaging. Packaging is also an enormous uh, research dollar. Are there really, are the products that are introduced every year as new products really new products? Um, rarely. Mostly it's a new label and maybe it's, as I said, you put it, thin it out and they call it a lotion. They thicken it up and call it a cream. You know, they put it in a can and call it an aerosol or a foam. Um, and that's, that's mostly what you get. Or they'll just sort of put it in a new jar, in a new label. Because many companies feel that women have no loyalty to their products. They get tired of them that we are fickle to our, you know, to our brand names. I think we're fickle to being, uh, buying products that don't work. We're trying to find something that finally does. And when women do find something that does work, they do stay with it. Um, the, the leading brand of cold cream has been the leading brand of cold cream for 30 years because it's a good, you know, solid product. How much help do you think the cosmetic companies get from women? I mean, we're buying all of these products, right? What, what, what do we really need? Well, uh, you know, we have a desire to, to look good. Of course, it's, it's, it's reinforced by advertising. It's reinforced by, by television and the movies. Um, women, you know, want to have a clear skin and thick, shiny hair. And that's basically what they want. I don't deal with cosmetics in the sense of makeup in my book because I think that's a part of fashion and it's, it's very interesting, sort of an anthropological sense, but that's not my, my field. Um, and women are just trying to improve themselves. And uh, I think the worst part of, of the loss that we get in the cosmetic industry that's not straight is that there are safe, there are effective and inexpensive ways of dealing with, you know, the whole multitude of, of skin and hair problems. And because the advertising is so oblique and the price is so outrageous that we are just, you know, losing out on what we could be doing. You said in the book also that the formulas for these products have been around for a very long time. Right. Cold cream uh, was around since 200 A.D. Um, this is the basic concept, and um, the original concepts of using oil as unguents started with the Egyptians, and they, you know, used... Now we're going back to some of the things. I think it's a very um, aggressive concept to go back to herbals or, you know, what they did in the Middle Ages, because people died in the Middle Ages at 35. Uh, women were old at 20, and... Um, you know, we want the latest developments for heart disease, for diabetes, for pregnancy. And I don't think that we should go back to, you know, medieval concepts of skin and hair care, which are medical problems. We are dealing with bi biological and physiological changes in the body. We're not dealing with, you know, some kind of aberration of the mind or, you know, miasmas. Is there scientific evidence available that cosmetic companies are... It are just not using? I think so, and I really don't understand why. For example, about 80% of skin wrinkling is believed to be due to the sun. And there are excellent sunscreens now on the market that can screen out about 90% of all the sun. And I don't see why our moisturizers and our foundations and our eyeshadows don't contain sunscreen. We just seem to be such a natural thing to do. I mean, that's one very basic concept there. Uh, and another one is that there, there is for example, the very best way of cleaning your face uh, outside pure soap uh, is um, a washable cleanser. It's a certain kind of a cleansing cream that you put on your face, you rub it around, you rinse it off with water. I mean, it's been shown, considering his, you know, the histology of the skin, why the skin gets dirty and what you should do to clean it. This is one of the best ways of cleaning it. Yet it's very hard to find this product. And the most widely available product, which is the cleansing cream that you put on, it's very greasy and thick, you just tissue off, just doesn't do the job at all. I mean, I just don't understand this is sort of an irrational preference that's been sort of foisted on us. How do you know what to buy in a suntan lotion? What are the ingredients you should look for? <clears throat> on the back, and they have, these right now have to be listed on the label because the FDA considers these drugs uh, for two chemicals. One is PABA, paraamine benzoic acid, which happens to be vitamin B6, and a methyl uh, salicylate. 
And sometimes these ingredients are surrounded by big chemical words, but just look for those you know, two things in, on the back. And um, these are the best products for sunscreens. Deborah, do hormone creams work? Uh, it depends what you mean by work. Um, <laughs> they, don't, they don't rejuvenate your skin or make you young again. Uh, but what, what a hormone cream does is that it helps the skin hold water. You know, um, the estrogens have a water binding capacity. That's why people gain weight um, in their monthly periods. And um, the, the similar effect is done on the surface of the skin. Uh, however, the, the hormone creams can pass through the layers of the skin and can get into the body and cause sometimes overuse, cause um, changes that you just don't want. What, the an, an imbalance or something? Yes, uh, for example, um, sometime, I think there was a contamination of, um, this is many, many years ago, about 30 years ago, of um, a vitamin cream and that men who used it developed breasts because there was a contamination with estrogens and um, women who, sometimes women become almost addicted to creams, they use it you know, hourly on their hands and hourly on their face. And uh, if you use a hormone cream this frequently, you can get um, spotting, bleeding spotting. Uh, but this is a very, you know, unusual case. It's, it's a huge overuse. Um, and hormone creams, you know, it's what they're doing. Yes, they do make your skin less dry. They will make the wrinkles seem a little less deep because they're plucking up the skin with a little water. But you can get the same effect from other creams that have other water-hungry substances uh, with, without the you know, the thought, well, maybe I shouldn't use an estrogen cream. There's some other assumptions in the book that you kind of shoot down that we've all had for a very long time, and one is we all feel that facial massage is helpful to our faces, right? Um, and you say no. Well, it's really very, very bad. I mean, it, it's a very archaic uh, concept. It was devised completely, you know, out of, out of the field of medicine whatsoever. Um, you know, the thought that rubbing at a face and tearing at it and pulling at it is going to restore uh, the collagen tone is really silly because uh, the thing which gives the face its strength and flexibility, the, the skin, um, is the collagen fibers. And as you get older, they get brittle and fragile. And if you push at them and pull at them, you're going to break them some more. So you're just you're not doing yourself any good. And ditto for facial exercises because, you know, one, part of the reason that we wrinkle is that we're pushing and pulling our faces around. Uh, just the daily talking and laughing and, and eating. And so there's no need to go, you know, like that and roll your eyes at just pushing your face around for something you don't need at all. What about the fads like the uh, herbal creams and things like that, things with pineapple in them? Pineapple is supposed to have some sort of soothing ingredient or something? Okay, well, you know, you, there's a whole bunch of uh, what I call the garden um, cosmetics. <laughs> and um, it, you can break them down. Some of them have properties that, that you do want. Some of them have properties that you definitely don't want. And the vast majority have absolutely nothing at all to them. Um, pineapple and, and uh, papaya have enzymes which do do a peeling action on the skin, but they have to be done carefully. You can have allergic reactions to them, and uh, you can uh, peel a little too much off. Um, as far as herbals, again, some herbs have activity. For example, chamomile has a soothing activity to it. Um, Comfrey root also is soothing. Uh, Things like uh, tarragon is delicious in chicken, but it's useless in a face cream. Um, and the same goes for things like raspberries and strawberries and peaches. Good with sugar and cream, but uh, just useless for your face. And uh, can cause allergies because the more natural ingredient, the more chance you have of an allergy. My favorite one on your list was parsley. What about parsley? Parsley, this is it's. It is thought, and there's, there's not very much scientific evidence backing this up, that it has antiseptic properties, primarily because of the chlorophyll in them, and that uh, the chlorophyll was found to have slight antiseptic properties um, during World War II when, during, in England, under the bombardment. There was tremendous shortages, and they were just scrounging around for whatever they could find to help with the war wounds. One of the things they found was chlorophyll, but today with a little alcohol or penicillin, we're much better off. In the book, you also talk about what to watch out for, for instance, when you're having your hair colored. Um, uh, lots of women have their hair straightened. What are some warnings about that? Well, you should never have your hair uh, double processed, uh, very close to each other. That is, either waved or straightened and then colored shortly after that. I was just talking to a woman and she told me that uh, this week, uh, two weeks ago I had my hair frosted. Uh, last week uh, I had my hair straightened and this week I have no hair. 
It was really true. I mean, she had sort of little clumps all over the place there. Uh, and that's, that's not the fault of the manufacturers, really. That's, that's the fault of just over-processing. You've, you've got to watch manufacturers' instructions. When they say to do something, you should do it exactly as they say. Deborah, why did you write this book? Um, I wrote the book because um, I, w I was working in a research lab at the time. And um, I was just amazed or appalled at the amount of misinformation that I had. I kind of considered myself pretty rational, and I knew uh, pretty decent biology. And, you know, I really believed that dry skin causes wrinkles, and maybe vitamin E can, you know, cure acne. And vitamin E can't cure acne? No, vitamin E can't cure anything. And uh, vitamin E can't get through the surface of the skin. In fact, it shouldn't. And if you push it through the surface of the skin, your chance of an allergic reaction is very good. And in fact, the FDA has, has warned manufacturers to remove vitamin E from their products. And you'll notice that the large companies don't have vitamin E in their uh, cosmetics anymore. The only ones in the back of the movie magazines you, know, you send away for, uh, those are the ones that still have vitamin E. How do you feel about the reaction of some women these days who are very anti-makeup and who feel that women should not be wearing makeup at all? We have about one minute. Well, I just don't think, I don't agree with it. I think that um, one's appearance is, is a very personal thing and a decision you should make yourself. And I personally like to feel that I look attractive. And um, there's just nothing wrong with it as long as you draw the line and don't make it the focus of your life. Deborah, what are the questions that women ask you most? They're usually questions about dry skin, what causes it, and how to take care of it and also about restoring the color and shine and the feel to hair that's been over-processed, that's too much dyeing, uh, too much straightening, too much waving, and uh, both of which are very easily controlled by you know, just the adequate amounts of information. Is there a quick home remedy for dry skin? Well, just about any oil you put on your skin is going to help it um, be from being less dry, but if you want to make a face mask, uh, you can take an egg yolk and a teaspoon of honey and just whip it up and put it on your face. The face, of course, is not going to eat the egg and eat the honey, but it's going to form a very airtight and watertight film on the face. It's just going to allow the skin to build up a good supply of water, and it's going to look less dry. Deborah, we're out of time. I thank you for being here. It's been most informative. Deborah's book, The Medically Based No-Nonsense Beauty Book. Thank you again, Deborah. Thank you for watching, and good night.